Hey everybody, what's going on? This is Sam from Historic Travels and welcome to another video. And as always, before we get started today, I'd just like to take a quick moment to welcome all my new subscribers and to thank everybody who's been leaving me comments and messages down below. Thank you guys so much, I really appreciate it. And if you would like to take a couple of extra steps to help support the Historic Travels YouTube channel a little bit more, there's a merch store and a Patreon for this channel in the links below. Thank you guys so much, I really appreciate it. And all right guys, well, you guys have been requesting this video for a very long time and we are finally getting to it. For this video, we are gonna be talking about J. Bruce Ismay. For those of you who don't know, J. Bruce Ismay is essentially one of the most infamous people who were on board the RMS Titanic during the night of the sinking, and he is essentially the most hated man on board the entire ship. So for this video, we're going to be exploring the claims, we're going to be looking at why he is so hated, and we're going to be discussing if there is any truth to this, and if he actually deserves this horrible reputation that he has received throughout history. Well, okay guys, well hey, without any further ado, let's get into it. The man you see in this photograph's name is J. Bruce Ismay. J. Bruce Ismay was essentially the chairman and CEO of the White Star Line. Essentially, this is the man who owns the RMS Titanic. Now, he was on board the Titanic during its maiden voyage. However, he was just on board the ship as a passenger. He was not a member of the Titanic's crew. However, due to his position with the company, his words would carry heavy influence among the Titanic's officers and crew if he should state an opinion about something. Now, the reason that Ismay has gone down throughout history as one of the most hated people on board the RMS Titanic has to do with his actions during the Titanic's maiden voyage and the eventual sinking of the ship. You see, where Ismay was essentially the president of the company, he kind of got the reputation that he essentially only cared about the company and that he didn't care about the lives of all the people who were on board the RMS Titanic. He didn't care what risks he had to take in order to make the company look good, even if it posed a risk to all the people on board his vessel. And to be perfectly honest, guys, I completely understand why a lot of people really believe this about Ismay. I mean, if you aren't an expert on the Titanic and you just hear a few of these things about him in passing, you would honestly believe that he was just a selfish head of a company who only cared about profit and didn't care about other people's lives and safety. A good example of this would be the whole lifeboat situation. You see, Ismay was one of the key figures who vetoed the idea of having more lifeboats on board the Titanic. Now, at first glance, this seems to go along with the whole they didn't think they needed more lifeboats because the Titanic was designed to be unsinkable. But if you really know the details of the entire Titanic story, you would then understand that lifeboats weren't thought of in the same capacity back then as they were, or as they are now. You know, back then lifeboats weren't seen as a means to completely evacuate a ship. They were seen more as a means of moving people from one ship to another ship in a disaster. I already made an entire video explaining that. So, for the rest of this video, I thought we would take a look at several of the most well-known and documented controversies that Ismay got himself into during the maiden voyage of the RMS Titanic. We're going to take a look at these controversies, we're going to first explain what people say happened, and then we're going to go in and take a look and analyze it, and see what's true, what isn't, and see if Ismay ultimately deserves the reputation that he got on the night that the RMS Titanic went down. Now, the first real bit of controversy around Ismay during the Titanic's maiden voyage occurred on Saturday, April 13th, 1912, one day before the sinking of the RMS Titanic. On this day, Ismay met up with Captain Smith in a room on the Titanic called the Reception Room, and the two of them basically just sat down and they talked in here about the whole performance of the Titanic up to that point. You know, they talked about how the ship was doing, you know, the conditions of the weather and speed of the ship, etc., etc., you know, just basic stuff. And the reason we know that they met up is because they were observed by another first-class passenger who talked about it later after the sinking of the Titanic. Now, as far as everything they talked about during this conversation, we don't really know. We don't know the whole story. The only thing we know for certain is the few little bits of information that she reported that she overheard. And what she said that she heard was that Ismay suggested to Captain Smith that the Titanic try to run at full speed. Up to this point, the Titanic had not been performing at her maximum speed, even though the ship was making excellent time. And this is the source of all the controversy. You see, even though Ismay was just a passenger, he would have been constantly getting updates into how the Titanic was doing throughout the voyage. So any ice warnings and so on, you know, he would have been informed about it. And people like to say 
that because of this conversation, it's proof that Ismay was ignoring the ice warnings. He was basically ordering Captain Smith to speed up to try to get the Titanic into New York early so it could make press headlines, you know, make the morning papers, you know, Titanic, biggest ship in the world. Oh, and it's also the fastest ship in the world. You know, you gotta sail on the Titanic and basically help the White Star Line. It seems like Ismay was caring more about how the Titanic looked than the safety of everybody on board the ship. So, is there any truth to this? Well, the only thing we know for certain about this conversation is that Ismay did suggest to Captain Smith that if it was possible, he would like the Titanic to try to proceed up to full speed at some point during its maiden voyage. More kind of like a test run more than anything, just to see how the ship would perform. And if possible, he said he would like the Titanic to try to arrive a little bit earlier than planned. But I need to stress this perfectly. This was not an attempt to break any kind of speed record. You see, at this point, the ship that was holding the speed record for the fastest transatlantic crossing was a canard ship called the RMS Mauritania. This ship was designed to cross the Atlantic as fast as possible at the cost of luxury on board. The Mauritania was nowhere near as, lux as luxurious as the Titanic was because this ship was built for speed. The Titanic was not. So the speed record was out of the question for the Titanic. It's more likely that what Ismay wanted was for the Titanic to attempt to beat the speed record of its sister ship, the Olympic, that it did on its maiden voyage, you know, the Southampton to New York route. And from a business standpoint, I can understand that. It would look very good for the White Star Line if the brand new Titanic was slightly faster than its older sister ship, the Olympic. However, in all my research, it does not appear that Ismay ever did attempt to order Smith to try to have the Titanic run at full speed in dangerous conditions, like an ice field, for example. It appears that all Ismay did was suggest to Smith that if it was possible, he would like the Titanic to try to proceed at full speed just to see how the ship would perform, and maybe, if possible, the Titanic could beat the Olympic speed record from Southampton to New York City. But yeah, bottom line is, I really don't believe that this simple conversation between Smith and Ismay had anything to do with the disaster of the Titanic whatsoever. Because even if Smith said, yeah, we may try to bring the ship up to full speed, they hadn't even done it yet. You know, they weren't even going to do it until Monday. So honestly, you would think that if they were trying to go for some speed record that they would light the boilers right then and there and try to accelerate the speed right there and that right then and there on the spot. But they didn't, you know? It'd be another two days before that a plan was even implemented under the right circumstances. And another thing that makes me really believe that Ismay wasn't trying to dictate to Captain Smith what to do was just due to the fact that we don't know much about that conversation. You know, from the testimony we have that this conversation happened, it seems like it was just a simple exchange between Ismay and Smith. People remember things more clearly if there's something more aggressive about a conversation. Like if Ismay had been dictating to Smith to do this, you would think that we would know more about the conversation. But just because we only have a very limited amount of information about it, well, to me, that suggests that it was just a very simple exchange between two people. You know, if something is heated, or there's a heated discussion or a heated debate, people pay more close attention. And the reception room is a pretty busy place. So you would also believe that if they were, if Ismay and Smith were having a heated discussion, that more people would have been around to observe this conversation, and we would know more about it. But the fact is, we don't. And that really makes me believe that this was just a simple conversation between the two men, and that this controversy really doesn't have any merit into Ismay having anything to do with the Titanic speed, thus causing the Titanic to hit the iceberg. The second big controversy with Ismay occurred on the actual night the RMS Titanic went down. You see, if you believe all the conspiracies about him, it would make you believe that Ismay himself was directly involved in the sinking of the RMS Titanic, and his actions caused the Titanic to sink. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, a few minutes after the Titanic had struck the iceberg, the ship's engines were restarted again briefly while damage inspections were carried out. And the conspiracy would have you believe that this was all Ismay's doing, pushing the crew to restart the Titanic's engines in an attempt to have the Titanic continue on to New York. The conspiracy would also have you believe that Ismay was going around talking to key members of the Titanic's crew, like Joseph Bell, the chief engineer, and trying to get them to say that the flooding on board the Titanic wasn't as bad, so the Titanic could attempt to continue on to New York. They would also have you believe that Ismay didn't really do anything to help out with the evacuation, 
And they would also make you think that when push come to shove and Ismay realized how dangerous of a situation they were in and that the Titanic was going to sink, he cowardly jumped into a lifeboat and abandoned the Titanic with 1,500 people still on board. So let's talk about some of these claims and see if any of them have any merit of truth in them. All right, so let's address the big one first. It is true that not long after the initial impact with the iceberg, the RMS Titanic did return on its engines and resume its course to New York very briefly after the iceberg impact. The ship turned its engines on again roughly two to three minutes or so after the initial iceberg impact, but then the Titanic shut down its engines for the last time around five minutes later. So a very, very narrow window of time here that the Titanic was actually continuing on under her own steam after the iceberg impact. And guess what? During this window of time, Ismay was nowhere to be seen. He was not on the bridge. He had nothing to do with the decision to turn the Titanic's engines back on. He was actually still getting ready to come out of his room to see what all the commotion was about. So that, that basically has been debunked. Ismay had nothing to do with that. Now, as far as the claims that Ismay was going around talking to members of the Titanic's crew to try to get them to say the flooding wasn't as bad as it really was, well, there isn't any real evidence to suggest that that actually happened, but there is evidence that he actually did go around and talk to members of the Titanic's crew about the situation. We know he talked to Captain Smith, but again, it was just Smith telling him the seriousness of the situation, not Ismay dictating to Smith what to do. Ismay was also reported to have been seen talking to Joseph Bell, the Titanic's chief engineer, but it was a very brief exchange, and then one man went one way, the other man went the other way, and that's as far as we know about all that. Now, as far as Ismay's actions during the actual sinking, as far as helping people to evacuate the Titanic, it seems to me, based on my research, that Ismay really didn't do much during the entire sinking of the RMS Titanic. There is testimony from survivors that say Ismay did alert them that they were in trouble and that they needed to get up on deck. But that's about as much as I can find regarding to Ismay's actual actions during the sinking of the Titanic. Now, it does seem that at one point during the sinking, Ismay kind of was beginning to panic a little bit. And he kind of tried to help lower a lifeboat away, but in a panic state. He kind of like freaked out and was like, get this boat into the water now. Go, go, go. Lower the boat. Lower the boat. We got to hurry. And anyway, fifth officer Lowe was in the area and Lowe kind of had a, uh, Lowe kind of got annoyed with Ismay. He walked up to Ismay and basically chewed him out. He's like, what are you doing? Why are you here? What are you up to? And Ismay was like, do you know who I am? And Lowe, no joke, said, you're a passenger and I'm a ship's bloody officer, so do as you're told. And Ismay kind of like looked at him and was like, um, okay. And Ismay actually walked off. Now you have to remember, Lowe is underneath Ismay. And this was pure insubordination on Lowe's part to Ismay that he talked to Ismay in this manner. But yet Ismay just kind of was like, um, yeah, okay, um, you're right, uh, I was in the wrong there, I was panicking, so I shouldn't have done that, and Ismay just walked off. There is actually a deleted scene from the Titanic movie that shows this whole exchange between Ismay and Lowe, and I will show you that right now. Release the boats from their lockdowns! For God's sake, hurry! There's no time to waste! You fool, do you want me to drown a lot of them? Do you know who I am? You are a passenger and I'm a ship's bloody officer. Now do as it told! It's quite right. Now, if you ask my opinion, I really do believe that this whole exchange between Ismay and Lowe really is a testament to Ismay's character. Because, think about it. If Ismay really was this horrible boss or this horrible person that these conspiracies make him out to be, then you would think that during this exchange with Officer Lowe, who is very, very much Ismay's, uh, below Ismay in the company, that Ismay would have ripped him apart for that. But instead, Ismay just like, yep, I'm sorry, I was in the wrong, and then Ismay just kind of walked off. You know, just the fact that Ismay knew that he had made a mistake there and that he shouldn't have freaked out like that, to me, that's a testament to Ismay's character. So, if you want my opinion about Ismay throughout the entire course of the sinking, I think Ismay was just outside of his element because you have to remember he's not a sailor, he's a businessman, you know, and the whole sinking of the Titanic and everything, I mean, if you were just a passenger, who knows what that would do to you mentally, you know, and I can understand why Ismay would freak out a little bit. 
And Ismay really wasn't in a position to really do anything to help out the ship's officers in prepping the Titanic for evacuation. It's like he tried to help, but because he didn't really have any experience, he kind of just got in the way a little bit, or he was just there, so to speak. You know, he did what he could, but I guess in my mind, Ismay, the best way to compare Ismay to modern day perspective is he's that annoying boss who acts like he knows everything, but he really doesn't know anything, so he just annoys people in his staff who know what they're doing. That's kind of my opinion of Ismay based on what I've learned about him and his actions during the sinking. All right, so now let's talk about how Ismay ended up leaving the Titanic and how he ended up surviving the evening. You see, Ismay made his way into a lifeboat called Collapsible Sea, which left the Titanic from the very front of the ship on the Titanic's starboard side at roughly 2.02, 2.03 a.m., right around there. So very close to the end of the Titanic's life, Ismay finally left the ship. Now, the official story is that there were not any women and children around this lifeboat, and that William Murdoch, the officer who was in charge of lowering this boat, said that anybody who wants to get in can get in, and Ismay simply just walked and climbed into this lifeboat. If Ismay didn't get into this boat, there would have been an empty seat, and basically Ismay didn't prevent any women and children from escaping for getting into this lifeboat. If he hadn't have gotten in, this lifeboat would have simply just had an empty seat in it. But there is conflicting testimony around this lifeboat that essentially there was a mad rush for the boat and Ismay essentially forced his way into this lifeboat. So to be honest, it all depends on which one you believe personally because we don't know for certain what happened with this lifeboat. But if you want my opinion, I think Ismay just climbed into this boat and there was no rush or there was no aggressiveness with it. I simply think that there weren't a lot of people around this lifeboat and that Ismay just climbed into this boat because if he hadn't have gone, then there would have just been one more empty seat in this lifeboat. So yeah, and in case you're wondering why I reached that conclusion, I really just think it has to do with Ismay's character and what I've learned about him and based on his actions that it appears that he did throughout the sinking. You know, everything that I've studied and learned about Ismay, he's no Captain Scatina, that's for darn sure. You know, it seems like he was just out of his element, you know, and he was a businessman, but it does seem like he was trying in whatever limited capacity to help people escape the Titanic. And you also have to remember, he didn't leave the ship until 2 a.m. So, I mean, he was on board the Titanic for most of the sinking. You would think that if he was just this horrible person, this horrible businessman who didn't care about anybody but himself and his company, that he would have left the Titanic or tried to leave the Titanic in one of the first lifeboats he could. But he didn't do that. You know, he stayed on the Titanic throughout most of the sinking and left at the very, very end when it appears that there was just an empty seat in a boat that he just took. You know, if he didn't get in, there'd be an empty seat. But as I said, this whole thing is open for debate. But based on what I've learned about him, I really do think he just climbed into this boat and that there wasn't any kind of fighting or sneaking around on his part in order for him to survive the sinking of the Titanic. All right, everybody. Well, hey, I think I'm going to wrap up the video here because this video was getting to be pretty long. But just as a quick heads up, there is going to be a part two to this story because Ismay's story is not over yet. There is more to it. Ismay would be the subject to another controversy once he gets on board the Titanic's rescue ship, the Carpathia. And there's a whole other story around what him and his company, the White Star Line, did, or probably a better word to say is didn't do, for the victims and the families of the victims of everybody who was on board the Titanic that night. And I want to talk about all of that in great detail. But now, as far as Ismay's actions and reputation during the actual sinking of the Titanic, I'm not talking about all the stuff that happened after the sinking, that'll be in another video. I don't think Ismay should be classified as a villain in the Titanic disaster. From what I've seen and studied about him, he really didn't have anything to do with the sinking at all. But at the same time, I wouldn't classify him as a hero either. You know, it's just, he wasn't in his element, you know. Sure, he may have tried to help during the sinking and help out with the evacuation, but as far as just, you know, telling some people they need to get up on deck and that they need to prepare to evacuate, which is important, I'm sure that did save a few people's lives, he wasn't directly involved with the evacuation itself. He was just kind of there. But yeah, due to the fact that he did stay on board the Titanic throughout, the in throughout most of the sinking, and, you know, he didn't leave the ship until 2 a.m., you know, that's a far cry from a coward. You know, that's a far cry from somebody who 
only cares about himself. You know, just the fact that he did try to encourage people to get up on deck and get away from the Titanic before it sank, and the fact that he just, he did hang out and try to be useful, sort of, you know, that says to me that he really wasn't as bad of a guy as a lot of people tend to make him seem to be. And I don't think he deserves to be branded as the villain of Titanic. But at the same time, I kind of get why he got that reputation because, as I said earlier, if you just have a passing interest in Titanic and you only get little bits of the story without knowing the big picture, I get why Ismay didn't look good. You know, he didn't look good at all in the grand scheme of things. But in the end, I don't think he deserves that bad of a reputation. However, you'll see in part two, I do have some serious issues with some other things that he will do. And I do have some serious issues with what his company, the White Star Line, did to the poor families and victims of the RMS Titanic disaster.